Have you grown tired of increasingly lukewarm and wishy-washy political messaging in your favorite media? Do you wish game companies would grow enough of a spine to actually say something instead of vaguely suggesting that maybe racism is kind of bad? Are you starting to feel like developers are just too afraid to make actual statements because they don't want to lose money? Well, if you've ever wanted to hear something say fuck Nazis as loudly as possible, the game you want might just exist, and for the low price of $10. Get in the Car, Loser was sold to me as a gay road trip RPG that had no compunctions whatsoever about stating its politics. And in an industry rife with half-baked platitudes kept as safe and ambiguous as possible, that's something I was keen to see more of. If you're curious about whether it's worth your time as well as your money, strap in and buckle up for a leftist's thoughts on a very openly leftist piece. Get in the Car, Loser is a 2021 indie game created by Christina Love and a team of developers at Love Conquers All Games. It opens on our main character, Sam, getting harassed by a member of a cult that worships an entity called the Machine Devil. Following some typical far-right nonsense about how degenerates are ruining the world, a suave non-binary hero with a cool pink convertible called Valentine, an equally cool name, rolls in to pick Sam up and take her on the adventure of a lifetime. Her spunky and hot-headed acquaintance, Grace, has made off with a powerful weapon called the Sword of Fate, said to be the only thing that can bring down the threat the slumbering machine devil poses. Now Grace is being chased by an order of angels which refuses to do anything but preserve a tenuous peace. Poor, timid Sam's only option as an accessory to this case is to tag along on a road trip to fight the ultimate evil. Right away, the game makes it abundantly clear what it's about. There's no room for compromise or moral ambiguity. Good and evil are delineated without argument. The ultimate evil is, in this case, a representation of a very real and very hateful political movement that exists to make minorities' lives hell. Rather than fight back, however, many choose to stay silent and neutral, including the all-seeing divine order that dictates the laws which govern humanity. These angels are the agents of the status quo, which reject any social upheaval, which notably allows the story's neo-Nazis to maintain a platform that grows increasingly violent. Grace, noble young woman that she is, decides to steal the Sword of Fate because she's tired of seeing so many stand by and do nothing, while the world burns, figuratively and literally. It doesn't take a genius to note the allegory here. Fascism is an inherent evil which, if allowed to spread in any capacity, will do irreparable harm. Therefore, to fight it outright is the morally correct thing to do, even if it is against the establishment's rules. The more subtle aspect of this parallel is the pointed position that governing institutions already possess the tools and the power to dismantle harmful ideologies, but instead choose to withhold protection and resources from those who truly need it, turning a blind eye to blatantly insurrectionist right-wing movements, while harassing and breaking up leftist ones no matter how peaceful they are. This is a bold and divisive position to take, but this game sticks to its guns through and through. I almost have to commend the developers for how closely they were able to replicate hyper-conservative buzzwords. The blacked-out slurs and hypocritical reliance on the concept of free speech were in no way exaggerated. There were times when I thought that maybe the story was being a little bit too on the nose. Maybe it would benefit from being just a little bit more subtle for elegance's sake. Then I remembered there are a number of people, both online and in real life, that do talk exactly like the villains in the game, and decided that it was for the best that they're portrayed to be just as ridiculous as they are. Besides, there is every indication that the writers behind the story pulled a lot of it directly from their own experiences. It is here that the story shows its heart the most. Many of the discussions that take place about mental health, about dysphoria, about sexuality, and about toxic relationships hit close to home because a deep understanding is folded into them. One such example is when Sam makes a self-depreciating joke, and rather than laughing it off, Valentine takes the time to address it as the problem that it is. To be so comfortable with putting oneself down that you can do it in front of others is an issue that doesn't just show poor self-esteem, but continues to negatively affect it. What's more, it makes others uncomfortable to hear. To recognize this takes a level of humility and self-awareness that I can only assume comes from someone who's overcome this hurdle themselves and given a lot of thought to how it affects their relationships. Val's not wrong, after all, that sometimes the best way to improve your opinion of yourself is to fake it till you make it. The strength of exchanges like these, however, make other parts of the group's dynamic feel lacking. One might be surprised to learn that they barely know each other given that they're already acting halfway like a polycule by the time the first act is over. There's no rule when writing relationships that says that they have to be clearly defined. However, Sam's shy demeanor is often counteracted by how willing she is to flirt with the other members of her party, and how willing they are to flirt with her in turn. It's not that the extremely gay nature of the characters is at all a surprise. The fact that the game is going to be gay is right on the tin. 
It's that authentic character development is at times abandoned in order to make something more mimetic or give it more appeal to those who read primarily coming-of-age romance. One criticism of this game that I've heard is that the characters all talk like they're on Twitter. It makes for dialogue that can be wildly funny, but sometimes that's just not a substitute for interactions that feel like they actually took place between real human beings. The characters were really enjoyable. It's hard not to be charmed by Val's smooth-talking or Angela's first real attempts at socializing with humans. It is, however, mildly immersion-breaking when these characters can, at a moment's notice, become a vessel for some tangent or joke that the author really, really feels like making. It makes for writing that is entertaining, but not of the highest quality. In a piece that is doing its damnedest to make an actually important political statement, it can be almost distracting. This is not to say that jokes aren't allowed and that all works that lean hard into their politics have to be incredibly sanctimonious and uptight about it. The game's title itself is mimetic, a Mean Girls reference so prolific that even people who haven't seen the movie would recognize it. What I think could be improved about some of these exchanges is recognizing when something makes sense for a character to say, and when it will create tonal whiplash. Topical whiplash is another aspect I had a hard time with. On the one hand, the game reiterated its core message a lot, standing firmly on its point that the alt-right is dangerous and its ideology needs to be resisted by any means possible. This, I thought, was a good thing. Other conversations serve to buttress this point, or if not directly reinforce it, then to provide important discussions that tap into each character's psyche. Essentially, dialogue serves either to build the world, to make the characters more colorful, or to make the game's argument. Sometimes, though, the dialogue veered off into random issues that hadn't really been important before and weren't again. It's not that unrelated topics have no place in the game. The conflict with Val's ex, for instance, gave us meaningful background on Val's character, sent an important message about abuse, and gave insight into the nature of the people the game villainizes. Here we obtain a profile of the people alt-right messaging is most likely to appeal to, and we can see how they can become warped from bad to worse until they're hardly recognizable. As an example of the problem I'm talking about, I would highlight the act that is dedicated entirely to Sam fighting a manifestation of her dysphoria given physical form. This is an idea that I thought was really cool, but not executed as elegantly as it could be. The front half is a lengthy mental monologue in which Sam wrestles the implications not just of the transphobia of the Redditor boss, but of the fact that her friends brushed it off. Although one can't expect a mental breakdown to stay completely focused, there was a level of inauthenticity present here. It felt as if Love wanted to cram every political question that was important to her, some of which are ones you see primarily on Twitter, into this game. The focus on Sam's specific problem here, that is, the dysphoria her friends unwittingly triggered and the circumstances that surrounded it, is distracted from by other considerations, like what constitutes a lesbian. I don't want to say that it feels preachy, but there are some points in this scene and elsewhere where I definitely felt like I was just sort of being talked at. I've praised this game for its refusal to say anything but what it wants. I stand by this praise too. The forward politics do far more to help this game than to hurt it, but I think every argument needs a focus and various supporting points. To return to the Sam example, it is perfectly relevant and important to discuss how trans women are forced to deal with trans misogyny, both from inflammatory sources like online rightists and from other leftists who don't understand the problem personally and may or may not mean well. What made it odd were the aforementioned diversions from this actual issue, as well as the fact that it is not only irrelevant for the first part of the game, but also never relevant again. In fact, we go on to learn that Sam is a princess, growing up sheltered and receiving complete support from her parents throughout her transition. It's not that even the most comfortable and well-off trans women can't feel self-doubt and dysphoria, but rather that this revelation, combined with the fact that said issues never crop up again, seems to retroactively confuse the point. What are the problems that the game wants to address fully, or that are there to bolster character development, and what are the ones that the game seems in a hurry to cover so that every possible leftist contention can be discussed? At the end of the day, the game is preaching to the choir. It's not likely that anyone who disagrees with its principles is going to play it. Thus, it reads as a presumption that players don't already understand these issues intimately and need to be educated about them. This isn't my biggest criticism of the game, however. The thing that irked me the most was the thing that is really foundational to one's enjoyment of any game, the actual gameplay. Get in the Car, Loser is an RPG the likes of which I've never seen before. Its battle system is real-time and relies on chaining and staggering using key inputs with cooldowns. 
There is no flexibility to dodge or run around the field in combat. It's a back and forth sequence determined by how quickly you can hit keys, all while paying attention to factors like elements and special enemy abilities. In a way, it's a bit like early Final Fantasy combat, but less straightforward and more fast paced. This was a system that was promising in its uniqueness. What ultimately made it fall short was the fact of how counterintuitive it was. Between the lack of tutorials and the often sudden introduction of mechanics that don't really get explained, there's a lot that's left to the player to simply figure out themselves. I didn't realize, for example, that in order to unlock higher level items in the shop, all characters must functionally be that level via their equipment, a level up system that is also counterintuitive, clunky, and often frustrating. People who watched me stream this game will know that although I was having plenty of fun with the story and characters, I just didn't have fun playing the actual game. That's a huge problem for stories told in this medium. Your story can be phenomenal, but what is incentivizing players to actually experience it if they get annoyed by what it takes to do that? Other people may feel differently about the gameplay, but I've heard similar comments about its tedium, which is why I felt it important to highlight. I think a lot of this could be remedied simply by including more tutorials and other instructional material. Another piece is that although a fundamental part of RPGs is a bit of a grind, it shouldn't take quite the amount of time that it does to get the items necessary just to level up. All of the dramatic tension built up just before a boss fight tends to disappear pretty rapidly when the spike in difficulty makes it a struggle that requires a few more hours of grinding and repeated attempts. One can never be sure how much they'll need to be on the road to get their characters to a safe level, and even on easy mode, the amount of gear collection and consolidation that needs to take place grates on the nerves. And as I've stressed before, this game does have important things to say. I want to appreciate those things without so much of the necessary grind in between. So with that, I come back around to answering the big question. Is this game worth your time? I will repeat that it was made under the group Love Conquers All Games, and to its credit, you can feel that a lot of love went into it, and not just from direct contributors. Christina Love even managed to get the creators of other acclaimed indie titles, including none other than Toby Fox, to write descriptions for items from those games, like the chewed pencil Susie gives Chris in Deltarune. Although this is such a small part of the picture as to be negligible, that tells me that there were many other people that thought this was a story worth telling. The length of the credits alone tells me that. For that reason, as a story, I think that it's worth experiencing. As games continue to come out with lukewarm critiques of capitalism that don't leave any valuable impressions or offend shareholders, it is a very refreshing change of pace to play a game that openly and unapologetically criticizes systems of power and the refusal to acknowledge the struggle of marginalized people. Even so, my answer to that big question is ultimately a, it depends. If you want to experience it in the most hassle-free way possible, I recommend finding someone else's playthrough and watching that. At the time I downloaded it, it was free. Now it's $10, which is a small price to pay and one which the developers deserve, but maybe not one you can freely dispense on a game that you may not actually find fun. That said, if you happen to have a lot of time for keyboard smashing on your hands, nothing bad will come of giving it a try. This is, after all, the sort of independent expression that the game industry desperately needs more of. Supporting art with diverse casts and subversive themes remains as important as ever in these difficult times, especially when they're coming from small, independent groups that rely on our support to exist and keep making the same art. Many AAA companies will offer less than the bare minimum and pat themselves on the back for it. This game, setting aside any criticism I have of it, is more earnest and thoughtful than many high-dollar titles on the market these days. And why shouldn't we have more gay road trip RPGs? Is that not in line with the spirit of our times?